All right, we are live on Facebook. Happy Crohn's and Colitis Awareness Week, everybody. My name is Rebecca Kaplan. I am the Public Affairs and Social Media Manager for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, and I'm excited to be coming to you live tonight to talk about kind of a hot topic that we haven't explored before, but sex and intimacy and IBD. So this week we're exploring all sorts of topics related to how IBD affects not just you in the gut, but also out of the gut and other areas of your life that may not necessarily be physical. So emotional, and obviously we're gonna talk about sex tonight. Um, so although most IBD patients are physically capable of being intimate, there are times when they just don't feel like it. The mood can be dampened by a fear of incontinence, body image issues, abdominal pain, fever, or sheer tiredness. But there are ways that through proper disease treatment and open communication with your partner, IBD patients can engage in healthy and intimate relationships. So over the next 30 minutes or so, we're gonna explore different aspects of intimacy, sex, and IBD. And I'm excited to be joined by three awesome members of the IBD community. Jordan Axelrad, who's an ulcerative colitis patient from Orange County, California. Kate Scalisi, who is a sex educator. She runs Passion by Kate. She's also an IBD patient. And Dr. Jordan Axelrad, who is a gastroenterologist with NYU Health and is also an IBD patient himself as well. So we've got three patients and a caregiver ready to chat tonight with all of you. Um, so a few quick disclaimers to get out of the way before we get started. As always, the information provided during tonight's chat is meant for educational purposes only. IBD exp is experienced differently by every patient. If you have specific questions regarding your disease and sex, please consult your gastroenterologist or healthcare provider. The views shared during today's chat do not represent the official position of the foundation. And as usual, tonight's chat is focused on sex and intimacy with IBD. I know you guys out there have a lot of questions related to IBD and all sorts of topics, but to stay on schedule, we're just going to focus on sex and intimacy. So you can always reach out to our IBD Help Center at info at Foundation.org with your general IBD questions or really anything related to the disease. And if you are watching, please chime in, say hi, let us know who you are, where you're from. Um, and how you're making IBD visible during Crohn's and Colitis Awareness Week. And with that, I feel like that was a lot of information in like two minutes. We're going to get started. So let's start with the basics. Kate, can you talk a little bit about the difference between intimacy and sex? Yeah, absolutely. So often we use the term intimacy as a substitute or euphemism or, you know, safe for work term for sex. And in reality, intimacy really has something like 20 com components, different components from trust and comfort to things like physical intimacy, of which sex is one of them. And the issues that I most often see kind of when I'm doing when I'm working with my sex and couples counseling clients is the ways in which these have kind of gotten mixed up and conflated where any sort of physical intimacy is seen as initiating sex whether or not that's what both one or both partners wants to happen and or there is no intimacy outside of sex right and so knowing that there is a difference between the two and looking at how the many different types of intimacy are showing up in your relationship in your sex life as well as you know having the sex piece is really important and the other thing here too is sex in our culture in the u.s at least really has one specific meaning. So oftentimes clients will come to me and say like, oh, we're not having enough sex. And I go, well, what do you mean by sex? And like, you know, sex, real sex. And I'm like, okay, but what do you mean by that? Because there's really a whole range of wonderful sexual activities that people can do. And when we expand our idea of what sex itself means, we're able to access our pleasure in so many more ways, regardless of all of the other stuff that's going on in our lives and with our health. Great. That's a really great explanation and a good kind of setting, scene setting for this chat. So Dr. Axelrad, and I'm hoping everything is working. I know we had some technical issues. From a medical perspective, how can having IBD affect one's intimate or sexual relationships? First of all, can you, you guys can hear me okay. Is that right? Okay, perfect. Um, and thanks for confusing everybody by putting two Jordans uh, in one <laughs> video chat. And I will... And, and apparently I called you both the same name. Oh, so my last name was <laughs> You said my last name was yours, too. So. 
There you go. Well, I'm more likely to respond to Jordan than I am to Dr. Axelrad, so it's it's going to be confusing. But um, <laughs> what I what I'll say about sexual uh, interest and sexual function from a medical perspective. Um, is that clearly, you know, IBD has a huge impact on sexual interest, satisfaction, sexual function, other determinants and quality of life. We don't really understand a lot about it. Um, from a research medical perspective, there's really only been a handful of studies looking at this more clearly. Um, but of course, as we all sitting here can imagine that um, IBD itself, the treatments that we have to take, surgeries, need for surgery, need for hospitalization, all of these relate to impaired sexual function, impaired quality of life, and into various other psychosocial, you know, um, determinants. And so uh, de definitely there's, there's lots of um, sort of uh, integrating uh, factors that cause sexual dysfunction or poor quality of life as it relates to sexual function. Um, and IBD is a huge, huge part of that. Um, recently, there have been a little bit of better studies looking at this more closely, um, and it's been reported in certain populations that over half of patients with IBD have some sort of impaired sexual function. Um, this tends to be maybe a little higher in women than in men, but overall, uh, sexual function is really quite impaired in IBD. Um, and this crosses like the gamut of things could be for, for men, you know, you know, erectile dysfunction or other, uh, other impairments for women, it could be decreased uh, libido, decreased interest, and um, these are all related to all the, the sort of factors that I mentioned. So I'm going to open this up to all three of you, and I know this is kind of a touchy topic, so if you don't want to respond, you don't have to. But in what ways has your disease impacted either your intimacy or sex life with your partners? And I'm going to throw this to the Jordan we haven't heard from yet, the Jordan W. So, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I can kind of speak to how I'm, I'm living with a J pouch now. So I can kind of speak to how it impacts me now. Like I thought about this question and, and I kind of laughed, like spontaneity is almost completely gone. <laughs> like as far as, Oh, you know, I'm feeling in the moment right here, right now, the way I am just being like type a personality, like I'm a planner. Like I need to make sure that like, you know, for example, if we go out, you know, if I go out to a nice dinner and have a big meal, you know, I need to think about things like later on in the evening, like, you know, like, you know, you kind of picture that movie scene where they just bur burst into the room and immediately start going at it. Like to me in the back of my head is like, well, shoot, like I should probably like use the bathroom first, just in case. So to me, like a little more thought has to go into things. And maybe that's just something that I am concerned with, but yeah, you know, I can't quite be as uh, spontaneous as I would like to be maybe. Okay. Kate or other Jordan? Yeah. Um, when I was first diagnosed, and this kind of gets to uh, what Jordan A was talking about before too, with the impacts, um, the grief and the anger and all of those emotions, right? We, we often talk about sex as if it's just this physical thing and it's just so not. And all of that just really put a damper on just any desire to be intimate or sexual period. Um, and over time, as I, you know, found the right medication regimen and was able to find more acceptance about my disease, start to feel a little bit better, um, a lot of that desire started to come back. And for me, this question is a little complicated because I also got diagnosed with arthritis around like within a couple months of my Crohn's diagnosis. And it had gone undiagnosed for so long that there's, and all of my stuff is in the same, it's in this like little square right around my small bottle like everything is right there in my body and so for me there's so many other confounding variables that were happening at the same time and it really just came down to being more communicative um and working on if not love and joy and even acceptance neutrality around like this is what i have and i don't have to be happy about it i can be cranky about it but just being with what is and the other thing I'll say too is like, I was in a relationship where prior to my Crohn's diagnosis, we've been together for a very long time. We didn't even fart around each other. <laughs> and I've talked about this before. So like nothing I'm saying is, is, has not been on the internet before. So like, as you all can imagine, look, I'm turning, I'm turning bright red, even though I talk about this all the time. Um, that was a huge change in our intimacy, right? Separating the two out again. We're like, oh, that's just not even possible anymore. So it really was a reestablishment of like, what do we want our relationship to look like? And what do we want our sex life to look like? And in many ways, 
it's, it's been a good process and it's helped me help my clients more because everyone goes through some sort of reassessment at some point in their life. And for those of us with Crohn's, we just do it a little bit sooner and with a little bit more complication than a lot of other people have to deal with. It's funny you said that about the fartings. So my husband was diagnosed two months after we started dating. And I literally don't know that there ever was a time where bodily fluids and yeah. gas was ever something that we were shy about. It just wasn't. We were long distance for eight and a half years. It wasn't an issue. I mean, he's been known to be like, Becky, can you come look in the toilet? And I'm like, Dan, yeah. really? <laughs> like some things just no. Yeah. Okay. Jordan, you have anything else you want to add? So um, I guess I'll sort of echo what uh, both Kate and, and Jordan said, which is that uh, I think that they're for Kate really mentioned on sort of like the uh, intimacy, emotional aspects of it. And Jordan sort of alluded to the functionality, the more practical aspects of it. And I think that there's a lot of planning that has to go into um, into having a sex life. You know, I was diagnosed when I was in college, which I think um, is a time where people are having a lot of sex. And um, there, there certainly needs to be quite a, a, an amount of, of planning and preparation. And especially if you're not partnered, you know, I... I wasn't partnered when I was in college, that that took a, a more of a thought process, more of a planning. And that alone affected my mood and interest, the fact that this was requiring so much thought and planning. So I think that um, all of these uh, things really culminated and, you know, treatment in theory uh, should should really help with a lot of these um, symptoms and, and what people are experiencing. But But for me, I think the planning aspect is something that I carried with me. All right, so I think I'm going to differentiate the Jordans by using your last initial. Sure. The Jordan A, this is for you, should intercourse be avoided when a patient is flaring? And if not, are there any precautions? That you take? So I think that uh, this is very individualized. So I, it really depends on several factors. So if for patients who are having a lot of significant symptoms, they're on prednisone, things like that, you may want to just be a lot more careful. Um, of course, you know, you should only do whatever you feel most comfortable doing. You know, if you're having a tremendous amount of abdominal pain, if you're having a lot of bloody diarrhea, um, some of these, you know, participating in sexual activity may be challenging. And I think that Kate can probably weigh in about the importance of, of relating to one's partner and um, understanding and those emotional connections that can help patients and partners get through this. Um, but I, I don't think there's really necessarily a rule as far as like, if you're feeling this sick, having this much activity, symptom wise from a disease standpoint, that sexual activity is not, you know, not permitted. Um, I think that for patients who are really sick and having a lot of symptoms and, and especially diarrhea, bloody diarrhea, that may be something that you may want to avoid, you know, until things are better. Um, just in terms of exacerbating whatever symptoms you're, are being experienced. But I think that should be left up to the individual patient. And I would just add um, briefly to that. I think there's often an assumption that when patients, so just quickly, I have a background working with cancer patients as well. And I saw this kind of in, on the chemo floor where there's an assumption that when patients are on chemo or in a flare that they don't want to have sex. There's this kind of desexualization that happens and this infantilization that happens to patients so often. And then we don't even have the conversation and there's not even that option to say like, oh, hey, what do you want? So I think obviously always check in with your doctor, always take care of your physical health and also check in with yourself around like, what do you actually want and how can you kind of get that physical connection? And again, remembering that physical intimacy is such a broader umbrella of which intercourse is just one little tiny piece. Okay, so Kate, what tip do you have to help patients feel more comfortable discussing their needs with their romantic or sexual partner? Yeah, so I always, whenever I'm doing a, an event or a workshop or a class, encourage people to kind of use this as their excuse to start the conversation um, or to like go to go read something and then be like, oh, see, now I heard about this. I think that having a reason to bring the topic up, something that you can rely on is really helpful. And I've seen this be really supportive to my counseling clients where saying like, hey, I was on this Facebook Live about sex and IBD. You know, how would you feel about having conversation about that? 
So that's part one is if you haven't been talking about this, like find a reason and you feel free to use me as your excuse. <laughs> I can't speak for the whole panel, but I, I give myself, there you go, use it. Um, and the second piece is to have the conversations be regular. So particularly if you're in a relationship, I always encourage kind of a state of your union, regular chat, maybe it's weekly, maybe it's monthly. And you talk about like what's going well in all the different aspects of your relationship. And this could be something that you really ritualize and make fun, right? You have, maybe you go for, I'm like in New York, and like you go get hot chocolate and walk around the holiday market and like talk about these topics just together. You do something to make it a special moment that you look forward to rather than like, oh gosh, we have to sit down and have a talk, which is not fun or inspiring or sexy to anyone. And then I think, you know, for people who aren't in relationships, it's really one of the common questions you get is like, when do I tell people? And it's, it's so individual. And I, you know, every, for every person who's like, tell them as soon as you meet them, you'll find 10 other people who are like, eh, you know, just tell them as absolutely needed. So I think just really tuning into your values around that and, and making that call independently. Okay. So Jordan W. I know that you underwent three surgeries to remove your colon and create your J-pouch. What concerns did you have throughout that process about your sexual function and future sex life? And how did you address those concerns with your doctor? That's a good question. So I didn't really have, you know, I was at the time of my surgery, it wasn't surgery because I wanted it. It was surgery because I needed it. I was so very sick that my back was against the wall and I didn't really know about complications to your sex life that could be, you know, a product of these surgeries. So I just kind of went in just thinking like, hopefully this will just help my IBD symptoms. But the doctor, my surgeon then told me, he said, you know, you know, we can do this three-step J-pouch surgery. We can do it in two steps, but um, you know, there's a risk that we can damage the pelvic nerve. Um, and so I asked him, you know, I, I was so sick. I was like, Oh, well, what's the pelvic nerve? And he was like, oh, well, that controls erection and ejaculation. And then so I immediately said, do it in three surgeries. Um, I didn't want to. So like, I wasn't aware of the risk, but I was presented with the risk. And then I think I made the right decision. They, you know, thankfully, my surgeon was looking out for me because he said, you're so sick and you're so just like torn up and inflamed that I would recommend doing it in three surgeries. So luckily I had, you know, I had somebody who's looking out for me. That's really I think, important. Yeah. I, I was just going to add, I think, um, you know, Jordan W represents a, a very uh, important and unique patient population, you know, the, the surgical or post-surgical patient. So I think you have to think about sexual function and, and intercourse a lot differently in a surgical and post-surgical patient. And mm -hmm. I, and other than just, you know, sexual activity, sexual function, sexual satisfaction, I also encounter a lot of conversations about things like fertility. So all of these things, especially for people sort of our age, and, um, you know, all of these are related. So um, I, I think that that's really important that this is a more of a unique patient population that requires a lot more counseling and a lot more um, attention. I do feel that sometimes, like, with the J-pouch patients, it's sort of like, that redheaded stepchild of IBD patients, it's sort of like, well, you've got your surgery, you know, you're, you're done. You know, so I, I and I said this in another video where it's like we're not out of the woods yet. So well, a pouch patients are... never out of the woods. You know, a pouch patients never out of the woods. But yeah, it's a narrower group. Yeah. So Jordan A, can someone with IBD engage in anal intercourse, and are there any precautions they should take? So um, I think the same precautions would apply to uh, any other sexual intercourse. So um, for patients who have severe disease. Um, proctitis, UC proctitis, recently flaring, bloody diarrhea, um, those sort of things, you, that probably should be avoided. Uh, for patients who are using, currently using a lot of rectal therapies, you may also want to avoid it just in terms of, you know, um, mechanically injuring the area and or causing some sort of, you know, exacerbation. For people who are in remission or have mild symptoms, you know, I think that that's totally fine and that shouldn't be any interference whatsoever. But especially for people who are actively flaring, um, that may be something to avoid temporarily. Um, the other, just like we were mentioning, are post-surgical patients. So uh, especially patients with a J-pouch, like this is really not studied. You know, there's not great guidance on how to recommend post-surgical pa patients, 
you know, I've had a J pouch about anal sex or post surgery patients generally in sex. There's not a huge body of literature in IBD. Um, but I think that each patient has to listen to their body and you have to go on what your symptom burden is and how sick you are, what your disease activity is. I think that speaks to knowing a lot. You, you should be informed about what's going on with your health um, and make those decisions. Yeah. And in terms of precautions, I mean, for anyone who's doing any sort of anal intercourse, fingers, toys, penises, whatever, um, you always want to have a lot of communication. It should never hurt, despite this, again, cultural idea that like it has to hurt. It, it shouldn't. And in fact, that pain is a sign that you need to slow down. Um, and there always needs to be a lot of, of lubrication. And the anus does not self-produce like a vagina does. So there needs to be that. And it, those are just general good practices. And you always start small and work your way up. Those are really good tips and things that most people probably don't think about. So <laughs> Bouncing back to the other Jordan, Jordan W. Um, I know that you've talked before about when you had your ostomy, you had, your body image was really affected by it. What did you find to be helpful in making yourself feel more comfortable engaging in sex during that time? Yeah, I mean, going into my first surgery, like I wasn't even sure like what an ostomy was. I remember waking up and being like, oh, okay, you know, that's, I got that going on now. So I went from, you know, being very active and physically fit to then being so sick where I couldn't work out and then having this ostomy. And, and I just, my, you know, I wasn't prepared for the change. So what I will say is having a partner who was very open. I mean, at the time she was there to watch the nurse change the ostomy bag and, and was very involved in the process and very open and also very patient, like patient with me, like, okay, I understand what you're going through. Um, you know, I'm kind of, I'm ready when you are type of a thing. So just, I, I was, I felt more comfortable when I knew that my partner was okay with it. Um, and also very patient with me, not rushing me um, into doing anything I didn't feel comfortable with doing. I mean, I would, I would sleep with a shirt on, which I never did. Um, so just that, that patience and just, just caring, you know, and you can't really, teach that or train that. So we actually got a comment from Amber Tresca that says, seems like sex gets forgotten a lot and did surgery discharge instructions. If the doc doesn't give any guidelines, patients should bring it up because we're all different. Jordan A, is sex talked about in surgery discharge instructions? I know when my husband had his bowel resection, they did mention it because it was part of the six weeks no physical activity, but. Right, right. So, so nowadays um, we're trying to do better about including um, instructions regarding or guidance regarding sex in the discharge. Of course, you know, when you're in a, ho a hospital-based setting um, and there's millions of doctors and residents and fellows and nurses and pharmacists and certain things may get sort of left out for uh, because people are trying to get, you know, objectively get things done and get you in and out of the hospital. Um, and so a lot of these more important, you know, quality of life, psychosocial issues sometimes fall to the wayside. Um, I think recently we're trying to do a little bit of a better job with this. And I think a lot of that has to do with the relationships that surgeons have with their patients. Um, so I'm not a surgeon. So I tend to talk more about these sort of things, fertility, sexual function, whatever. Um, but I think we're starting to do a little bit of a better job with this. And if patients have these questions, um, they should especially ask them. And if they're not sure they're f uh, comfortable asking, they're like 70 year old gray haired surgeon, then they should ask whoever they can. And I think that that's really important to just get yourself heard. Um, but I think we're trying to do a little bit of a better job with uh, putting some of these issues out there. So Kate, what tips do you have to help patients feel more comfortable, both physically and emotionally when having sex with an ostomy? Yeah, so I'm going to geek out for like 30 seconds That's part of answering this. So within the field of, of sexuality, there's this thing called the dual control model. And basically what it says is that our brains, we have a sexual gas pedal and a sexual brake. The gas pedal is noticing anything in our environment that is sexual. Whether or not we like it doesn't matter, right? If our brain is like, oh, that's a sex thing, hits the gas pedal. At the same time, we have this break that's noticing all the reasons why like sex is not a good idea to have right now, whether that's like a lion chasing us or dreading the holidays with family, right? Um, and for IBD patients, we have a whole lot of all of these going on probably all the freaking time as has already been discussed. 
And most, a lot of the conversations that happen around sex are like, hit the gas pedal, like hit, keep adding things that are sexual or sexy or turn ons without noticing and remembering that, right. You can hit a gas pedal all you want. And if there's a, you know, one ton brick on the, the break, you're not going anywhere. So the first question is like, what is, what's hitting your break as it relates to your ostomy? What's holding you back? Is it the physical stuff? Is it the mental, more of the mental, emotional body image? What are the particulars of what's holding you back and do that kind of self-reflection? Also, you know, again, do you want to be having sex? And it's okay if the answer is no, it will likely change. We all go through ups and downs in our desire. So do you want to, what are the things that are holding you back? And then you could start to address those specific things, whether that is with a, with a healthcare provider, with a sex therapist, you know, whatever it is. And one of the things that I love the most about being in this field is that for everything that is a turn off to someone or squick someone out, there's someone out there for whom it is a total turn on. So there are so many things that can be researched um, that can assist that already exist. And we don't have to reinvent the wheel around like, hmm, how do I deal with potential leakage? What are the things out there that can help with that? How can I feel more confident in my body? Whether that's things like ostomy lingerie or doing again, that work around body image that of course I'm, I'm biased, but personally and professionally always think it's best to work with a therapist or counselor to start to address some of those things and get, take them out and look at them and say, okay, this is what's here. Do I need to do anything about it? And if so, what can I do about it? So getting to those underneath causes, which I know is not the like nice shiny answer we want of like, here's a tool to use, but it leads to change that's long lasting and helps to address all of the issues at all the different levels. That makes total sense. Um, Jordan or Jordan, do either of you want to add anything? I'm stealing that gas pedal, brake pedal. Go for it. Dual control model is the best. I love it. You can tell how much I love teaching about it. It's the best. <laughs> um, we did get a couple of comments I just want to bring up. So Amber Wallace Ogle said that she found that showing her ostomy to her now husband before being intimate helped her feel more confident. Most people really didn't think less of me because of my ostomy. If they did, then I think less about the ostomy and more about their character. Kind people will be attracted to you regardless. 100% agree. And I, yeah, think, I think that goes for anyone, not just ostomy patients. Yeah, I think I want to just, you know, as, as we've already highlighted, um, you know, ostomy patients, post-surgical patients are a really unique group. And so um, body image is... 10 times more important in this group than the regular IBD population. And obviously it's already important for patients with IBD generally. Um, and so the, the image uh, issue is really a big deal uh, in terms of sexual function and especially in post-surgery and peri-surgery patients. And so for all of my patients, especially the hospitalized group that are undergoing kind of urgent emergent surgery, like it sounds like Jordan had, um, this is a huge deal. So whether this is the right thing to do or not, and I'm glad Kate's here, you know, I frequently point patients to other patients. So I'll make my female patients generally speak with another young female patient um, who's had a similar experience, I'll point patients in the direction of Instagram and things like that to, to feel better about body image. And um, But there have been some really tough ones, especially in certain patient groups. Like I work here in New York as a large Hasidic population. You know, there's lots of other issues that are need to be culturally sensitive. So um, just putting that out there. So I have one more question for the chat, but we did get one that actually I want to add in. So Tina asks, how do we bring up the topic of sex to our GIs and or surgeons if it isn't brought up to us? She asks for pointers from you, Jordan A., but I'm going to also open it up to the others in case you guys have any tips. Um, so any pointers? I guess I'll, uh, what, I'll, what I'll just mention briefly is that um, I... I'm okay with patients bringing anything up to me and they generally do because I'm, again, a, a younger person. Um, with that said, I think it's sometimes challenging in like a 10 to 15 minute office visit to talk about how you've been doing, what we're doing, what medications are we doing? What's our plan for moving forward with mm -hmm. scopes and imaging and labs? And then be like, oh, how are you doing? How's your quality of life? How's your sexual interest? It sometimes feels a little um, uh, unrelated. With that said, most IBD centers, including where I work um, you know, at NYU, we have a dedicated IBD 
um, psychologist and psychotherapist. And, and this person's really, really super helpful for having a little bit more time and more expertise um, in this. That's really important. And if your IBD center or your doctor facility doesn't have one, you can look at the Rome Foundation, who is putting yeah. together a psycho psychogastroenterology group listing, mm -hmm. some sort of resource where you can find a mental health professional who is engaged in the GI field. Um, Jordan W. or Kate, do you have anything you want to add? I mean, I always, I never would expect my GI to speak to me about my personal issue, like maybe my sex and intimacy issues or, or anything like that. I, but I would hopefully say, who can you point me to? Mm. And hopefully that leads me to a professional in that, you know, that arena. So just ask, ask a tough question, say, who can I speak to? Cause I'm feeling this way. You know, two quick things. Number one, um, that same strategy I talked about before, right? Particularly if you have an appointment this week or next or within the month, it's fine. Um, you can say like, hey, I was on this really interesting chat and I have some questions as a result of it. Um, and again, then you're kind of shifting the blame to us and it feels less like, oh, well, I just want to talk about this taboo thing. Um, the second piece just went out of my brain. So that's not helpful. Um, but the other thing I'll say to you and kind of to um, the point that was just made, you know, sex isn't sex and nutrition are two topics that medical schools don't cover extensively. So I love these additional resources that got mentioned as well, because there are those of us who specialize in this. Um, and yeah, I think it's worth knowing. And the second one still doesn't come back to me. So I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> Um, so the last question I would be remiss if I didn't ask since part of the foundation's mission is to fund research. Um, so Jordan A, can you share a little bit about any research that's currently being done around sexual function in IBD and are there any medications proven to help address them? Good question. So um, yes, there has been a lot of research recently trying to explore the topic of sexual function. Um, really up until this point, looking at measuring it. So recently some researchers from the Brigham um, including Sonia Friedman, have developed IBD-specific sexual function scales for um, men and women. So the, they're, for men, it's a 10-point questionnaire. For women, it's a little bit longer, 15-point questionnaire. But they involve questions like, you know, has, it caused, has IBD caused problems during sex? Um, has it made you feel guilty um, about intimacy or intercourse and things like this? And so we now have a good way of measuring sexual dysfunction um, and the next steps are understanding why it happens and how to improve it. So I'd like to say that treating IBD, become, being in disease remission, is associated with improvements in sexual function. We're not really sure if that's true. So there have been some other research recently that's demonstrated that sexual function um, may kind of persist in patients with IBD, but this hasn't been studied well. So, so at NYU, we have a multi-center study now looking at this question in more detail using some of these sexual function scales, specifically looking at groups of patients who are starting drug therapies to assess mm -hmm. them at the, when they start their therapy, at the end of induction, and in maintenance to see whether or not treating disease activity and, and achieving remission has a direct link with uh, you know, sexual function. Um, but again, the research is um, pretty basic and, and we're just learning um, a little bit more about it. It's a starting point, though, and that's exciting that we are, you know, looking into this field. I think it's definitely an area that needs to be addressed. So I know we went a little bit over because we had some technical issues. Jordan Sorry. W, can, are you, well, not just you now, Jordan W, are you still there? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can yeah. still. Uh, okay. okay. Well, your voice is there, but your photo disappeared. But <laughs> you're still here. That's all that matters. So I want to give a big thanks to Jordan, Jordan, and Kate for taking the time to chat with us tonight and for their commitment to supporting the needs of IBD patients. Do you guys have anything else you want to share before we close? Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. I remember yeah. the second thing. <laughs> well, go for it. Um, is, and this goes for any, any conversation that's feeling awkward. It actually really helps to just name that. Be like, I feel really awkward about what I'm about to ask. And just by naming it, you take away the power of that thing, right? Because things like shame thrive in silence. They thrive in secrecy. So as soon as you name it, it gets easier to then say the next thing and it cuts the tension. So that's what that was the second thing. Um, and yeah, just echoing the thanks to the foundation for having this, for prioritizing this conversation and really to each and every one of you for showing up and prioritizing your pleasure as well. It's not always the easiest thing to do and it's not something our society really supports. So thank you 
sincerely. Yeah, Jordan, I, I, yeah, I think the only the only thing I would add is that um, you know I I think I'm a little bit in a unique situation. There aren't that many gastroenterologists specializing in IBD who also have IBD, um, and I even have this on my NYU you know like website as part of my about me section. Um, but I think it's important to utilize people like myself, Kate, Jordan, uh, for patients who need a resource, then they, especially if they feel like they're not getting the answers or um, the help that they need to use the resources, either from the foundation or from us, um, to get some of their uh, concerns voiced. Other Jordan? I mean, you guys have spoken so beautifully. There's no way I can add to that. <laughs> OK. Um, so if you have watched or you're going to be watching afterwards and you have any questions about sex and intimacy or anything about IBD in general, you can always contact our IBD Help Center at info at Crohn's Colitis Foundation dot org or 888 My Gut Pain. And I do have to make a plug because Awareness Week still has four more days left in it. So it's not too late to get involved in helping raise awareness of IBD. You can visit our website at www.cronescolitisfoundation.org backslash awareness week to create your own personal infographic and much more. We're going to be talking on social media more tomorrow about sex and IBD. So tune in to see some patient stories, answer some polls, things like that. And then Thursday morning, we're going to be live again on Facebook from Washington, D.C., which is where I just got this evening. Um, where we are going to be broadcasting live from our Congressional IBD Roundtable. And with that, have a great night, everyone.